did making joy uh, make you feel more like moving to, on to writing or more like returning to filmmaking? It's always both for me. I love writing. You know, I wrote, I always write scripts. They become around 175 pages now. They could be, they are more novelistic. They have many worlds in them. I think many good movies have many movies within them that I find as I get yeah, older. Yeah, that's what I meant about the, it's not for sure. You still have to decipher it. You still have to break the code when you have these novels that are not scripts. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes. And a novel allows you to go into, you know, Jennifer's mother is into soap operas. So we shot a soap opera from the 60s to the 2000s with Susan Lucci and Morris Bernard, who's like the Brando of soap operas. And those guys are like professional athletes. You know, you say they do 100 scenes a day. <laughs> so they're my kind of actors, you know, like I'd go, I'd go Donna Mill, Susan Lucci, uh, let's have a cat fight. They don't go, oh wait, what's my motivation? They just go bang. <laughs> Because they've done a hundred catfights, I was like blown away by the power of these these women actresses. So um, that might be one of the most interesting things said at the table: the power of soap opera actors. That actually is a nugget, and I buy it a hundred percent. But they blew me away, and they're tireless. Susan Lucci re rehearsed a, a, a fight scene for nine hours. This is how they do it, and she got one take to shoot it. That's how they do soaps. Mm -hmm. So there's a world within the world. Mm -hmm. this, this woman of Jennifer that's playing in Joy is made up of a metal garage that De Niro runs. That's for real. Half the movie's based on reality. That's a truck and bus metal garage. This had big sides of trucks and buses smashing down with sparks and welding. I'm like, well, that's, we gotta have that. That's the world. <laughs> Too bad for the sound. You said to me that David Selznick, the son of immigrants, married Jennifer Jones, an all-American girl from Oklahoma, because in America, all races and all classes can meet and make whatever opportunities they can. And that is what you feel when you reach into people's homes with what you sell. You said that. Did you write the part for her? Because you've worked with her, what, th is it three times now? This is the third time. I, you know, we, we have to agree and be excited about it mutually, and it has to be something we've never done before. So what was the first conversation with her about doing this? You know, this was ambitious for us because Jennifer really goes from 10 years old, she's played by another actress, to 45 years old. That's a lifespan thing for me. And you have many generations of women. You have Diane Ladd, you know, you have Isabella Rossellini, two great actresses I always wanted to work with, amazing people who have a history personally of working with De Niro. So with Jennifer, we first talk about how is this different? Why would this be something we've never done before, an ambition uh -huh. we've never done before? Well, she never played a 45-year-old woman. She never played, she never played someone at 27 who, had a, uh, who married a Latin singer who had, had it fall apart. I never saw the best divorced couple in America. What is that? I got, you know, Anna Karenina is a soap opera. Is soap opera trash? No, Anna Karenina is a soap opera. But she, when she loses the guy, she throws herself on the train tracks, not joy the real joy or this joy, she keeps going. And the guy becomes her best friend. I haven't seen that movie. And he works for her to this day. Well, let's go to the underestimated question. Yeah. Because I was thinking you had a stretch of seven years where you, you had trouble making films. Yes. How do you deal with those things as a director? There's no greater inspiration you can give somebody than to underestimate them, some people. Mm. That's like, a, that throws down the gauntlet to them. Any artist, I think, can, uh, it's like J.D. Salinger, you know, he wanted to be a great writer, and he was a 25-year-old kid on Park Avenue who had a great voice. But it wasn't until he landed on D-Day and had trauma. He, went, he was in every great battle, Battle of the Bulge, uh, 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 the Hurtgen Forest, just eviscerating trauma. And he met Hemingway in Paris, who said to him, I think you got a good voice, kid. And that meant everything to him. But that made him, that pain and humility. At, uh, Holden Caulfield is a fractured war veteran. I never understood that with gray hair. That's why he's, he's not just an adolescent. But there's a fractured war veteran that's in all of us that endures what we go through in life. And the more you get, go through the blood and guts of your life and you get humbled, which I got humbled, mm. it's a good thing. It makes you more human. It makes you love more stories. You're more open to humanity, whether it's a working class person running a metal garage or someone who's gonna do something beautiful and sing. It's just, you gotta find the, the grit of it.